Chapter 32. Adverbs. Chapter 32 covers the following. The formation and comparison of adverbs. The irregular verbs wallo, meaning wish, nolo, meaning not wish, and malo, meaning prefer. And at the end of the lesson, we'll review the vocabulary which you should memorize in this chapter. There are two important rules to remember in this chapter. Rule 1. Like adjectives, Latin adverbs have three degrees, positive, comparative, and superlative, which are created by adding the following endings to an adjective base. To form the positive adverb, Latin uses a, long e, in first, second declension, or iter, in third declension. This is the equivalent of adding ly to an adjective base in English. To form the comparative adverb, Latin uses ius, the counterpart of more adjective li in English. To form the superlative adverb, it uses isime, where English has most adjective li. Note that irregular comparative and superlative adjectives produce comparable irregular comparative and superlative adverbs. So, for instance, a superlative adjective ending in limis or rimis will create a superlative adverb ending lime or rime. Rule 2. The irregular verbs wallo, nolo, and malo are the product of composite conjugation and contain athematic forms. There's really no part of speech easier to learn in all of Latin than adverbs. Three degrees, and that's all. No declining, no conjugating, no tenses, sequences, moods, and absolutely no relative time. Oh, yeah. The positive adverb is formed in Latin by appending long e to the end of a first, second declension adjective base. Certe, meaning certainly, for instance, or iter to a third declension adjective base like celer producing celeritere, meaning swiftly. Note that the long mark on a form like kerte is mandatory. It distinguishes the adverb from the vocative singular masculine, which has a short e ending. All regular comparative adverbs, no matter the declension of the adjective, use the ending ius, creating forms such as calerius, meaning more swiftly. Finally, Superlative adverbs use the ending isime, as in certissime, meaning most certainly. That's if the adjective forms a regular superlative. If not, it will look like whatever the irregular form is. Calerime, for instance, meaning most swiftly. That long e is also mandatory. So, with regular forms, all you have to do is learn a or iter, ius, Isime and done. Let's do a quick survey of Latin adverbs in their three degrees. You're responsible for knowing all the following forms. Fortunately, you already know most of them. Longe, longius, longissime, meaning far, farther, and furthest. Note the long e in the positive. For a third declension base, that will be iter, or sometimes just ter, as in sapienter, sapientius, sapientissime, meaning wisely, more wisely, and most wisely. Third declension bases that end nt like sapient use only ter, not iter. Other third declension bases, such as facil, meaning easy, don't use iter at all, but have a positive adverb, facile, which looks like the neuter nominative of the adjective. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Then, facilius and facilime, meaning easily, more easily, and most easily. Note that the irregular superlative adverb facilime is based on the irregular superlative adjective facilimus. And, of course, the seven deadly adjectives that exhibit wildly irregular comparison, bonus, magnus, malus, multus, parvus, pro, and superus, we covered those in chapter 27, all have adverbs that follow their deviant adjective counterparts. For instance, bene, melius, optime, meaning 
well, better, and best. Male peus pessime, meaning badly, worse, or worst. Multum plus plurimum, meaning much, more, and most. Magnopere magis maxime, meaning greatly, more, or more greatly, and most, or most greatly, that is, especially. Note two things here. First, magnopere is a combination of magna, meaning great, and opere, with effort. The expected form magne doesn't exist in Latin. Second, magus replaces maius, the neuter comparative adjective, which is not used as an adverb. Next, parum, where the adjective base parwa, meaning little, has been pared down to par, minus, and minime, meaning little or a little, less, and least. And pro, remember there's no positive of prior, prius, and primo or primum, meaning in front, before or earlier, and at first. And finally, one standalone adverb, diu diutius diutissime, meaning long or for a long time, longer or for a longer time, and longest or for the longest time. Comparative and superlative adverbs use and expect the same constructions their adjective counterparts do. Comparative adverbs can be and often are followed by either of the than constructions employed with adjectives, quam plus same case, or the ablative of comparison. For instance, clarius quam sol, meaning brighter than the sun, as in the fire burned brighter, that is, more brightly, than the sun. Or Latin could say the same thing by omitting quam and putting sol in the ablative case, sole. And just as with superlative adjectives, quam lends superlative adverbs a sense of as whatever the adverb is, as possible. For instance, quam clarissime, meaning as brightly as possible. From the historical perspective, Adverbs offer a fascinating glimpse into how Indo-European languages evolved. Proto-Indo-European didn't have adverbs at all. So, as the invention of forms which could modify verbs in the same way adjectives modify nouns began to spread around, its daughter languages had to invent their own set of adverbial forms. The ablative proved one popular choice, at least in Latin it did, where its natural with sense, as in with speed, was already one way of qualifying the action of a verb. So one type of Latin adverb developed out of the ablative, seen, for instance, in the fifth declension-looking ending a, long e, which for some reason was applied mostly to first-second declension forms. Elsewhere, a form that looked like a fourth declension ablative ending was used here and there, producing, for instance, Diu, meaning for a long time, based on the ablative of a now lost fourth declension word for day. Dius, dius. Can't say which I like less, dius or dies. Likewise, primo, meaning at first, recalls its ablative origin. Neuter accusatives proved another way to concoct adverbs, resulting in forms like the comparative adverb ending ius originally the neuter accusative of the adjective. That's why those forms are identical. Into this category can also be put facile, the neuter accusative of the positive adjective facilis, and even tam, umquam, numquam, and parum, all of which were at one time first, second declension accusative forms. These accusative-based adverbs were originally substantive adjectives functioning as direct objects, as in, he achieved much. How is much functioning in that sentence? Is it the direct object of achieved, or is it modifying the verb? In other words, is it a noun or an adverb, a verbal modifier? It's both, really, which made the transition from accusative adjective to adverb all the easier. All in all, I say this only to show you why you'll see a lot of adverbs that look like accusatives or ablatives, 
That's where they came from. Now let's look at three closely related irregular verbs, wallo, nolo, and malo. All are built around a base wall that means wish, seen in its simplest form in wallo, meaning wish or be willing. Nolo represents the negative, meaning not wish or be unwilling, a compound of the negating prefix ne plus wallo. Malo means prefer and is a compound of the comparative root mag, seen in the comparative adverb magis, meaning more, blended into the wall base. So literally it means wish more. All three of these verbs expect a complementary infinitive, wish to, wish not to, prefer to, but they are also all defective. That is, they lack some basic forms. For instance, only two of them have participles, Wallanes and nolanes. In other words, there was no malanes. If Romans wanted to say preferring, they had to use another verb. Only nolo has an imperative, noli and nolite, meaning be unwilling, singular and plural, which was used almost exclusively with a complementary infinitive to express a polite command. Noli tolerare stultos, that is, please don't tolerate fools. And none of them have passive forms. Be be willing, be unwilling to go there. Once you're past the present, things are as clear as day. No irregular forms whatsoever outside of the perfect base. For wallow, that's wallu, producing wallui, wallowisti, wallowit, meaning I have wished, you have wished, he, she, or it has wished, and so on. The perfect of nolo is nolui, meaning I have not wished, and of malo is malui, meaning I have preferred. And so it's only the present tense system that requires your attention at all. There, these verbs include the same sort of irregularities we saw in pharaoh, but far fewer. There are a couple of athematic forms, and one that's the product of composite conjugation, but that's all. The athematic forms, remember that that means the form has no thematic vowel, are wult and wultus, compare fert and fertis. But by the classical age, the Romans had all but completed the process of regularizing wallo, nolo, and malo, and adding in thematic vowels. And like Pharaoh, these three wish verbs were being subsumed into third conjugation, meaning the Romans used I or U as thematic vowel, and E in the imperfect, as we'll soon see following exactly the pattern you'd expect from a third conjugation verb in the imperfect like dukebam. A grand total of one form in each of these verbs is the result of composite conjugation, that is, two different verbs being combined into one. Wies, meaning you wish, known wies, meaning you do not wish, and ma wies, meaning you prefer. Otherwise, all the forms use a different but similar-looking base, wall. Note that the clash of different verbs here is far less pervasive than in pharaoh, where a tool or lot form shows up in half the conjugation. Here is the first of these wish verbs, wallow, in the present tense system. Its present indicative is wallow, wies, wolt, wallamus, wultis, wallant. Note the irregular thematic vowel U in the first person and third person plural. Note also that two of these forms are athematic, wult and wultus, he wishes and y'all wish. The second person singular, wies, uses a different base, making it the last surviving remnant of composite conjugation. Be careful not to confuse this form with its identical twin, the noun wies, meaning force, power, or violence. It's usually not too hard to tell a verb from a noun in Latin. If you've got wies and you need a verb, then it's probably a verb. You wish. The imperfect is completely predictable and regular. Wallebam, wallebas, and so on. As is the future, if you expect, as you should, third conjugation forms. Wolam, woles, wolet, etc. And if you remember sim, cease, sit, the present subjunctive of esse, 
then Wellim, Wellis, Wellit, and company will come as no real surprise. Here's the present infinitive, Welle. It's a thematic, the product of Well plus Se, the original infinitive ending, which means the imperfect subjunctive will take after it. Wellem, Wellace, Wellet, Well, Well, Well. Look at the present participle, Wallanes, meaning wishing, the only other form we have to address on this chart, since wallow has no passive, so there's no perfect passive participle, and no imperative either. If you want to say, wish me luck in Latin, you'll have to find another verb. Here's the negative of wallow, nolo. In the present indicative, it's nolo, non wis, non wolt, nolimus, non woltis, nolunt. From wallumus and wallunt, you'd expect nolumus and nolunt, meaning we do not wish and they do not wish. But non wis, non wolt, and non woltis are a bit of a surprise. I guess nis, nolt, and noltis were not to the Romans' liking. But they're okay with Amaremini? <laughs> Never mind. Let's see, what else can we check off as regular here? or at least predictably irregular. Imperfect, no labam, no labas, check. Future, no lam, no lace, check. Subjunctive, no lim, no lis, check minus. Infinitive, nolle, check half minus. Imperfect subjunctive, no lem. Well, if it's nolle in the infinitive, check. Participle, no lanes, check. Imperative, no li, singular, and no lite, plural, big check. No, I take it back, check minus. And that's all there is to know, lo. The third verb in this throng of Latin wannabes is malo. Wheelock doesn't formally introduce this verb in chapter 32, though he does include it in the back of the book, See pages 392 to 394. Add it to your vocabulary, please. You see it often enough in real Latin to make it worth learning. Plus, if you know wallow and nolo, learning malo's no problem. The present active indicative is malo, ma wis, not mavis, ma wolt, ma lumis, ma woltis, ma lunt. As we noted before, it's a contraction of magus, meaning more, and wolo, meaning wish. Wish more meant prefer to the Romans. By now you should be expecting the euthematic vowel in the first and third person plural, nor should it come as any shock to find irregular forms in the third person singular and both second persons. Ma wolt and ma woltis are athematic, and ma wis the product of composite conjugation. You could probably also have guessed that the imperfect is malebam, malebas, and so on, and the future malam, malais, and the like, the subjunctives malim, the infinitives male, thus the imperfect subjunctives malem. No participle, no imperative, no problem, right? Let's see. I'll give you some forms of wallow, nolo, or malo. You tell me what they mean. Like in the last chapter, pause this presentation and take what time you need in between each form to figure out its translation for yourself. First form. Non wis. What does it mean? You do not wish. You are unwilling. Next, volebamus. We wished we were unwilling. Malent. They will prefer. Well it. He wishes, subjunctively. Males. You preferred, subjunctively. No lueritis. Y'all will not have wished, or y'all have not wished, subjunctively. No limb. I do not wish, I am unwilling, subjunctively. No lee. Be unwilling, to, or please don't. And volentes. 
those wishing, willing in the nominative or accusative. At vos volentes procedamus ad verba vocabularia. Okay, that's not a Latin word. But this is dewitii dewitiarum feminine, meaning riches or wealth. It's a first declension feminine noun that's attested only in the plural. After all, can anyone be called rich who has only one rich? And how did lots of Romans get their riches? With an exercitus, exercitus, masculine, meaning army. It's a fourth declension masculine noun. Literally, it means a thing that fends, arc, here, erc, off, ex. So, what does an exercitus fend off? Hostes, the enemy, of course. And what English word do we get from exercitus? Exercise, which fends off something else just as bad as the enemy, doesn't it? What's the genitive plural of this word? Fourth declension. Fine. What are the endings? Us, us, ui, um, u, plural, us, uum, ibis, us, ibis. So, exercituum. The next word is honor, honoris, masculine meaning honor, esteem, or public office. It's a third declension noun, and it's not I stem. The basic meaning of honor is the last one, public office, seen in the phrase cursus honorum, the path of public offices. The series of official duties Roman citizens followed on their way to the supreme executive office, the consulship. Basically, a Roman man who wanted political power had to be an aedile before he could be a quaestor, and a quaestor before being a praetor, and a praetor before becoming consul. That was the path of offices, the cursus honorum all ambitious Romans had to follow. Only later did the sense honor or esteem evolve from the prestige accorded those elected to these offices. Next on the vocabulary list, are the adverb forms listed on pages 151 and 152. Please memorize these in all three degrees. Next up is a verb, amito amitere, amisi amissum, meaning lose or let go, its third conjugation. Amito is a compound of forms you already know, ab, meaning away from, plus mito, meaning send. To send away implied to the Romans to let go or lose. How would Latin say, they will lose? What conjugation? Third. And what's the tense sign for the future tense in third? E, so, omitent. And how about, to be lost, the infinitive? Good, omiti. Next, wallow, welle, wallowy meaning wish, want, be willing, will. It's third conjugation of anything. Will? No. That sounds future, which is not right. This verb does not convey a sense of futurity as such. Wheelock is alluding to an old meaning of will, meaning wish, as in the will of God. But we don't use that meaning very much today, and when we do, will is more often a noun than a verb. So forget this definition. Stick to wish, want, be willing. The negative of wallow is nolo, nole, nolui, meaning not wish or be unwilling. Like wallow, it's third conjugation of anything. And to this list add malo, male, malui, meaning prefer. Conjugation-wise, it's third, ish, like its brethren. All three of these wish verbs take complementary infinitives. The next word is custodia custodii feminine, meaning custody, a first declension feminine noun. The plural of this word, custodii, implied to the Romans guards, that is, people who guard you. So the singular custodia refers to an abstract principle, custody, the plural custodii, to the people who deploy it, the guards. Following this word is lates legis, feminine, 
meaning law or statute. A third declension feminine noun which is not I stem. There's only one consonant at the end of the base. A lax was to the Romans a regulation stipulated through law, as opposed to a use, which was a basic right, like free speech. This distinction between what the state can control and what one's humanity grants by nature underlies many Western judicial systems, including our own. It's one of the great legacies of Rome. What's the ablative singular of lax? Good, lege. It's not I stem. Next is scientia scientiae feminine, meaning knowledge, a first declension noun representing the abstract quality of knowing, skia. Next comes an adjective, dives divitis or ditis, meaning rich, a one termination third declension adjective, and thus I stem as an adjective. As a noun, it's not I stem. It works like potains or any present active participle. Don't confuse this word, a dives is a person, with the one you just learned above, dwitii, riches, which are things. A dives has dwitias. The base is either dwit or dit. Because the Romans during the Classical Age were in the process of dropping certain W sounds, especially those that were intervocalic, that is, between vowels. Remember how the perfect active of uo, help, shrinks from what ought to be uawi to ui? Well, obviously not all intervocalic w sounds were lost in Latin, but enough that it's worth noting the pattern. From this base comes one of the names for the Roman god of the underworld, Dis, otherwise known as Hades or Pluto. As Dis, he's literally the rich one. Underground is, after all, where all that gold is found. But rich? There's a death god named Richard? If I were a death god, I'd want a scarier name, like, uh, Mark. The next word is pauper pauperis, meaning poor or of small means. It's a one termination third declension adjective. And like dives, it's I stem when it's functioning as an adjective, and not I stem if it's a substantive, that is a noun, and it's a substantive often. We've seen one of the bases that underlies this word, pau, meaning little or not much, in pauci, the Latin word for few. Take pauci and change p to f, as English did via Grimm's law, and you get few, the same way pater and father are connected. The other base in pauper is pear, meaning bear, as in bear a child. So when the Romans said pauper, they meant having few offspring, being infertile, which is probably another agricultural metaphor at heart. The next word, yet another one termination third declension adjective, par paris, means equal or like. Par naturally expects a dative after it, equal to, like unto. How would Latin form the neuter nominative or accusative plural of this adjective? That's right, it's I stem, so, paria. And quickly on to caleriter, meaning swiftly or quickly. It's the adverb of caler, add it to the list of adverbs you should memorize on pages 151 to 152, why Mr. Wheelock didn't put it there in the first place, I have no idea. Here's a verb, pateo patere, patui, meaning lie, lie open, be accessible, or be evident. It's second conjugation. Note the absence of a fourth principal part. From that you've probably already guessed that pateo has no passive. Be, be opened, noli ibi te confere. The Latin base pot is cognate with Greek pet, which shows up in our Greek derivative petal, the part of a flower that opens. And following the rule cited just above, what should the P at the front of this base turn into in English? That's right, F. And the T? Think father. If pater goes to father, then just pot must go to fath, as in fathom.
a way of measuring the depth of the water you're sailing in. Originally, a fathom was determined by the furthest length you could hold your hands apart as you reeled in a sounding rope or chain, something that went all the way to the bottom. Then you pulled it up, measuring the depth of the water in the number of open arm lengths. How would Latin say, it was open, subjunctively? There are two ways to do this, aren't there? Imperfect and perfect. How would you form the imperfect subjunctive? Present infinitive plus endings. So, the imperfect will be pateret, the form used to show contemporaneous action in secondary sequence, one of the imperfect subjunctive's major uses. As in, yesterday I asked you in secondary sequence why the gate was open. Contemporaneous action. But what if you make pateret perfect? What do you add on to the perfect base to make an active verb subjunctive? E-R-I. So, patuerit, the form used to show prior action in primary sequence. As in, I'm asking you right now, primary sequence, why the gate was open yesterday, prior action. And the last word on this vocabulary list is prohibeo, prohibere, prohibui prohibitum, meaning keep, keep back, prevent, hinder, restrain, or prohibit. It's second conjugation. Latin idiom calls for an accusative and an infinitive after this verb, when you want to prevent or keep someone, accusative, from doing, infinitive, something. Wheelock discusses this on page 153, footnote 6. Literally, the Latin says, prevent somebody to do something, which, if you think about it, is perfectly logical or at least grammatical. English, however, has chosen to stress the idea of separation, innate, in prevent, but that sense of separation is there naturally in any verb that means prevent or prohibit, whether you choose to stress it or not. So Latin doesn't. It's just a matter of cultural choice. Do the rules that were cited at the beginning of this chapter now make sense to you? If not, please review this presentation. If so, please proceed to the next slide. For the next class meeting, please bring in a copy of the practice and review sentences for Chapter 32. You'll find them on page 154. Quam dulcissime vitam agite, o minores sapientes.